Path of Night is an actual play Vampire the Masquerade podcast set in the world of darkness. We're all friends, we're here to have fun, but our story can include graphic violence, drug use, sexual content, and other mature themes. Content warnings can be found in the show notes. We talk at our table about safety, comfort, and consent, both as players and storytellers. We know what to expect, we're all excited to be here, and we want you to feel the same. So listener discretion is advised. Now let's walk the path of night. Last time on Path of Night, Neil Sire confronted him and told him to walk the path of blood. He caused Neil to lash out and attack his friend Fester. Neil ran off into the night. Meanwhile, Britta was invited to join Roman Pendragon in the shower, but ultimately she declined. Johnny arrived in Neil New Haven to assist his daughter and the rest of the hunters with a furious werewolf. Wynne was attacked in Kabir's hotel room. A newcomer Tremere named Ira West received orders to go to New Haven and to met up with the Prince Miles there. Bredo, you've had a challenging few nights, and as you wake shortly after the sun sets, you find yourself curled up having slept in an awkward position in a hotel room in the company of one of the most feared slash hated kindred that this entire region has ever had to endure. And he seems peaceful and still. It's like the the feeling you get at someone's funeral. When at any moment they should move, but they don't. He, at least for the moment, is still as the grave. But it's the beginning of the night? It's the very beginning of the night. In the natural way of waking up, Britta almost starts to uncurl. But as soon as she spots that Roman Pendragon is still out, she kind of connects the dots and remembers various times that her Coterie members have slept in, especially after they didn't seem so regretful for things that had happened. And she starts to realize that he's going to be asleep a little longer than she will. And unsure what to do about that fact, she slowly finishes the motion of uncurling, but remains in the chair so as try not to wake him. What's going through Britta's mind right now? Britta is so confused. She feels like her feelings have been put through a blender on high for days in a row now. Having taken that quick shower before bed, she usually tries to use that kind of thing as a way to pull herself together, using the act of prettying up to find some sort of center. Right now, she just feels young and confused and vulnerable. She's so a little curled up in this chair. Her hair probably still has a little bit of dampness to it. And she just has one of those ratty uh, white hotel robes that you can find. Right now, she has a little bit of a nest, and there's some comfort in that, but it feels so artificial. And she feels like if she moves, she'll break that spell and everything will go wrong. She's thinking about how she feels like she... She can't decide whether she fucked everything up and now her coterie is in more danger than they would have been before. Or if something about seeing this horrible man sleeping ties in with seeing his scars before. There's like that flicker of realization that she could maybe, maybe she could, she doesn't even know what she would do, but she's realizing that she theoretically has a semi-sleep torpid alder here. (laughs) And that's a weird feeling. Just realizing some tiny amount of vulnerability while feeling so much of it herself and trying to pull together the objectives, the scattered objectives that are left uh, after all these days. As you watch him deep in thought, you can see the hotel door and the 
chrome metal knob slowly turn after the most subtle click. Now you're sure it should be locked, but for whatever reason, through whatever sorcery, it opens all the same. When it opens, Britta immediately calls out, Hello? You call out, and on the other side of the doorway, you swear you see a ghost. And there is Romeo. Spotting Romeo, her hands go over her mouth, and she looks to check whether that woke Pendragon. Give me a perception empathy. Five successes. He doesn't seem to have heard you. A flicker of confusion from Bretta. That doesn't seem quite right, but it's Romeo. So she extricates herself from her little blanket nest and slowly, a little confused, approaches the door. She doesn't quite go to it. She's going within speaking range, but I mean, part of her, there's a flicker of hope in her expression as she's spotting what seems to be Romeo. He seems like someone that she could see during all this when she's trying to keep her coterie away. But at the same time, it's weird. As you draw close, you notice that there's someone else at the doorway who was just out of view when you were further back. And you recognize the man by the row of razor-sharp teeth in his mouth. And you also notice one other thing. You hear the slightest movement behind you on the couch. And it would seem that Roman did in fact hear you and quietly sat up in the meantime. The man with the razor sharp teeth raises his index finger and presses them to his lips as if to shush you. There is only one hesitation before taking action and it is to check Romeo's expression. Romeo is stoic. Like whatever's going on, he means business. Britta's looking to Romeo in a bit of desperation. This is not a combination. Romeo's someone that she trusts, and that's the cause of her only memory of her parents being what they looked like when they were eaten. And him looking stoic is not helpful. And Britta takes a hesitant step away. You see someone, Roman says, eyes glancing towards the doorway, but unaware of whatever it is that you've noticed. Yes. The man with the razor-sharp teeth says a word, maybe a name, but whatever it is, it has immediate consequences for you. He says, Canary, now. And when that happens, you find yourself overwhelmed with the urge to eliminate anything that might keep you from rejoining the group that is in the hallway waiting. And you grab the nearest object and turn to smash it on Roman Pendrag and roll initiative. You will be using all of your levels of celerity that you can for the purposes of additional actions. So having woken up, I have four blood and three levels of celerity. Burn three blood. Let's go. Let's go. All right. 17. 24. Mm-hmm. That's a Roman fucking pen dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I rolled super well. <laughs> you rolled all right. <laughs> he will use his first action to defend himself in the event you attempt harm on him. Spoiler alert. You do. Give me a dex plus melee uh, for your attack made against him. Is this a graceful attack? Yes. I will say that you are graceful as you attempt to smash the coffee machine over his head. <laughs> if you had said bust of Scipio, I would have just peed my pants. God, like, they're right everywhere. Here. <laughs> <laughs> just Ikea has a rush on busts of They're not there long. It's a <laughs> consolation. That's why there's so many. Mm-hmm. Four successes. He has five successes and bats the object in your hand, annihilating it upon contact. That's his turn used uh, to defend himself. Mm-hmm. What are you doing? Your turn. All right. So I have a question as to how my canary command works. Must I try to eliminate or if it seems more efficient, could I attempt to disengage? You could attempt to disengage. All right. Then knowing what I know, I'm 
not thinking that hand-to-hand -hand combat feels particularly effective, and I'm going to try to close the distance between myself and the doorway. You run out the doorway. Do you close it or leave it open? I would leave it open. I'm trying to run away as quickly as, if, as I can. You make it out the doorway, mm. and just as you go to run the corner, you feel his presence behind you. With nine successes, you feel a cold hand grasp you at the back of your neck and yank you into the room. You are not rested back down on the ground, and while holding you still in the air, he says to you, stay still. What is this? What do you, who's here? Your turn. I'm certainly not getting out of this grapple. So I guess my next move is to attempt to convince him to let me go, which also feels like a crapshoot. Well, I've not known him to be particularly easy to convince, so I think instead I'm going to try to dread gaze. Okay. <laughs> uh, you're at difficulty 10, and you need at least two successes before you count as having gotten one. Shockingly, no successes. You botched. You may not use presence on this person. <laughs> That is the consequence of your botch. So Britta, increasingly desperate to follow the command, attempts to dread gaze, and there is a low growl deep in her throat, and it is pitiful. Uh, she already looks scruffed <laughs> and um, looking more vampiric and attempting to intimidate this man to let her go was a mistake. <laughs> you bear... Your sharp little toreador fangs at him, and his eyes narrow, insulted by the gesture. And he raises his fist, which seems to glow like a burning coal. And there's this hesitation, and you feel yourself dropped to the floor. And as you make a run for it, you don't see or hear any move to chase you. be like leaping off stuff and just landing using for it <laughs> absolutely cannot do that i will hustle in my sneakers as fast as i can it's okay that's I'll... why i wear them you underworld leap down to the sidewalk and head for your car <laughs> it's edgy as fuck your trench coat flows in the wind your katana at the ready <laughs> that is almost exactly how i pictured it thank you <laughs> So, for my own knowledge here, do you truly leap off, like, a second story floor? Like, yeah. it'll take me multiple minutes to catch you if I don't go the same way? I signal for you to go out the front door. I'll meet you there. He's going to let the car warm up. All right, well, basically, i got to get it out of wherever it is and then okay. yeah, All right. get to the road. And meet you at the front door. Yeah, it's yeah. just faster. That saves me some blood. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Ira will hurry down to the front door, thinking that there's trouble. As soon as he's out of the Elysium, we'll start muttering and casting, uh, moving his hermetically symboled gloves on his hands. A uh, storm purple Lambo pulls up at high speeds right in front of the, essentially where you're standing. Storm purple, nice. I uh, kind of admit I like the classic midnight blue. As he says, uh, getting into the front seat. I was like, let's chit chat, get in the car. He's doing it as he's getting in. <laughs> I will take off at as pretty fast speeds. Give me a drive check. I will stun two blood for dexterity. That'll be nine successes. With nine <laughs> successes, you weave through traffic. Every now and again, you hear someone's like, Oh, fuck you! What's this? And people start freaking out. But by and large, I'm already gone. while occasionally needing to ride the shoulder, you make your way. <laughs> and as you get to the motel, it's actually quite quiet. The door to the, the motel room that is being used by Wynn and Kabir as a jar. And inside the motel's, like, main room light flickers on and off. This is it. This is where she was. Inside? Yes. Oh, we're going inside. Would you like me to go first, Your Grace? I'll, I'll go. You All follow. Right. Uh, Lex, just so you know, for the next four hours, I will be fifth gen. Sounds good. I just immediately open the car door and hurriedly follow the prince. I'm moving in pretty quickly. Miles, you get through that door, and inside you see like there was a struggle of sorts. The TV is smashed. It looks like fingernails have ripped that cloth and some of the furniture. And laying in the middle of the room, as if all tuckered out from having trashed the place, is Wynn. Her eyes are open. She's staring up at the ceiling. Her mouth is agape, fangs out. And it seems like mentally she is 
frozen, trapped, and locked away. Physically, she seems fine. All right, Ira, this is out of my wheelhouse. So... I hope to God that it's in mine, then. To describe Wynne for Ira, who's never seen her before. Wynne, even in this state, you get the feeling Wynne sees more than she should. It's a little offsetting. Her eyes are, maybe back in the day, they looked a little bit like the same color and perfect roundness of a seagull's. But now they are the gold and focus and perfect shape of an eagle's. Her hair is stark white in a braid down the middle of her head and on the sides of her head where there is no hair, there are the patterns of various vipers. It's been described as, you know, cobras. It's been described as other snakes as well. But it is definitely snake scale patterns on the sides of her head. In her mouth, since her fangs are bared, you see that they are, in fact, rattlesnake fangs. Uh, There's probably some venom dripping if she's lost any control of controlling the venom that she has. To say she is attractive would be a lie, but there is good structure in her bones. She is extraordinarily pale. She is, of course, wearing her flannel and a blue and red buffalo checked flannel is tied, a scrap of flannel is tied around her left wrist. Her fingernails are long, but not manicured. They look like they are not meant for anyone's pleasure except her own. They, okay, I phrased that very wrong, but we're going (laughs) to stay with it because I'm on a roll here. (laughs) Um, They look like they could be They are to do damage. They are not to be aesthetically pleasing in their length. Her boots, you can tell, have been, they're at least as old as you. She is wearing jeans that don't fit right. She is surrounded by various books, a Latin dictionary, a copy of the Aeneid, some notes, a notebook, probably a copy of The Golden Ass by Apuleius. Clearly, she sees more than she should. She is a slightly feral woman, and something like this should not have knocked her out. Ira looks around, uh, eyes seeing a lot, perfectly clear and analytical, then looks up at Miles after he looks at like the sides of Wynne's head and the fangs in her mouth. Thought your uh, friend here was gangrel, not a setite. Gangrel. Okay. And Lex, I'm going to try and look around and tr- I guess try and figure out what the hell happened before I start trying to do stuff to wake her up. Why don't you roll me an investigation? I will, if I can, spend a blood because I would like to do that twice. Sounds good. I'm uh, I'm just going to keep alert since I can't investigate. <laughs> this made us some work. The prince manages. So on the first roll it is six successes and on the second roll it is four successes. Okay. With your six successes, you find yourself kneeling down and examining Wynne's nails and her hands, and you can see that there's little pieces of the TV stuck in her fingers, fibers from the fabric she tore. It looks like she is actually the culprit responsible for trashing the motel room. It's like she was struggling, but whatever she was struggling with wasn't there. In the second rule, you take a look out the window And outside the motel room, you can see that there is a pair of boots that seem to have treaded and left like the the starting of what could be a muddy print. And you start to kind of think that, you know, hey, these curtains are thrown wide open. So when saw something in the window and lost control of herself until she blacked out and whatever it is that harmed her, she is still under the weight of its power. Ira looks around and then kind of expresses some some of that to the prince. Frowns. I can. I mean, if it's if it's a matter of like harm done to her body, I I can try and get her up. But if it's all mental, I don't know. Whatever did this to her seems to have. I mean, it was either standing there and we can't see it, or it's fucked off. But something got in her head. I am willing to take advice on the scenario. I'm not sure. Maybe your pendant might have information, but I don't know anything about this kind of stuff. That's why I usually rely on win. Well, I can try. I just, you know, before I use thaumaturgy on, you know, your friend, coterie mate. Coterie mate, also, you know, Ambergino's protege. So. Yeah, um, well, you're the one in the room. That's why I'm trying to defer here. Give it a go. You good with it? We'll give it we'll a see shot. What happens. Lex, I would like to try and force her to spend a little bit of blood to heal. 
I don't know if it'll work if this is all in her brain. You reach down and you manipulate the vitae in her body. And how much of her blood are you going to attempt to make her spend? I can do 10, but I'm not going to do that much. I don't want to wake up starving. So right now, I'm just kind of try and force. I don't know how severe this is or if it's mental. This is a little bit out of my depth. So I'm going to do three for right now just to try and like... If there's anything suppressing it, to kind of kickstart it back up. Uh, but I'm not going to go crazy on it. I'm just going to try and like, okay, I'm a student of the blood. I know a lot about this kind of stuff. Sometimes the blood knows how to heal if you make it do it. And I'm just kind of hoping there's no external injuries, but if there's something inside that we can't see, like bleeding in a brain or something, that it'll fix it. Her veins darken as you call upon the blood and it attempts to heal her. But while it is expended... It does not seem to find purchase when attempting to hit its mark. Whatever wound she is suffering from is a wound of the mind. In fact, when you reach down to heal her, you notice that her pupils are like wide and there's this like fluttering of the eyes as if she is attempting to become conscious. But whatever has happened to her suppresses the mind. You think she might actually be able to hear whatever's going on around her, even if she doesn't completely understand it. Well, Your Grace, that answers that. Sometimes, failure teaches as much as success. So, her body seems fine. It's... something's wrong with her mind, but I think... I think she might be aware, kind of like a coma patient. So, if you got any encouraging words to help her fight whatever the hell's going on, I don't know her well enough. Most of my... Training's about defending my own mind, not helping other people get back from theirs. I'll give it a shot. I uh, I bend down, I put my hand on the side of her face, look directly into her eyes, and go, it's time for you to get up. Wait. No effect. Dang it. <laughs> Maybe her middle finger twitches a little bit, but... <laughs> Ira frowns. No offense, Your Grace. I, I kind of meant more. The she encouraging words of a friend... To someone who's in a coma, not a, not a mental command. It's worth a try. It's a fair point. <laughs> we learn from failure, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> he moves over, and kneels down next to him, like, "All right, I don't know what's going on in there, but I really need you to snap the hell out of it. Um, whatever's going on here, and I really." Really need this to not to be something new that's happening here. So I need you to. To, to fight whatever this is, realize that it's all in your brain, and um, come on back. No, there, there are mechanics for oh, this. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, Miles did not do well. No, probably not. Uh, with his words of encouragement. So I'm going to add a plus one difficulty for this roll. Sure. And that will take your difficulty to 10, and I want you to roll charisma plus empathy. Two successes are required as you attempt to nurture her. <laughs> and that is not, help her not through good. this this trauma that has been levied against her like a blunt force instrument. Well, <laughs> does natural leader or enchanting voice play a factor into this? I will allow enchanting voice to play a factor into this. Natural leader is an LOL no. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I don't know what's up. Her brain's busted. Natural Leader uh, <laughs> expresses that Miles does indeed have the talent to be able to lead very, very well. But it is not a guarantee that you're <laughs> applying yourself. That's... Look. <laughs> it's been weird. I just traveled with Tremere here. That is already way different than I'm used to. <laughs> I show up and she's just... All right. I'm spending a willpower. Uh, four successes plus one more is five. Win. Mm -hmm. With five successes in the deepest parts of your mind, the portions of you that hide your hopes and dreams, your fears, and the core of what it is to be when you find yourself trapped there, crushed under the weight of the wounds inflicted upon you by this horde of aggressors. And somewhere deep in that, you can feel the condescension of Miles attempting to mind control you. <laughs> Look, you gotta know your audience, is all I'm saying. <laughs> and this rouses you to anger. <laughs> However, what can you do? 
you've been reduced to torpor, beaten down in one of the most unfair fights you've ever fought. And that's when you hear Miles casually tell you that it's not real, that the map battle is in your mind. And you think maybe, maybe this one time, Miles had said something intelligent to you that doesn't offend you. <laughs> Look, he's due for a win, and so to speak. Indeed, he might be, as he successfully convinces you that the assault you endured was perpetuated with the use of chemistry, and it was an illusion. And so I require from you a self-control check to not assault Miles for <laughs> attempting to dominate you. <laughs> I just roll self-control. It's just self-control, buddy. Okay. And I can't spend a willpower or I can't? You can. Okay. I'm going to. <laughs> because I really genuinely believe he's doing his best. <laughs> but he's so fucking condescending. <laughs> two successes. Okay. With two successes, you stave off the desire of your lizard brain to rend him asunder. Your eyes open, blinking now. You look about your surroundings and you see these two men. One you know very, very well. The other you don't know at all. The fluttering of her eyelids stabilizes her pupils narrow because she's decidedly not looking at anything she wants to see. But to a certain extent, she is. So maybe they flash down and then flash out back open a bit. There's sort of a, a dart back and forth as she sees. And then she immediately jumps to her feet and runs over and slams the door and just starts spending blood to buff her physicals. As you're getting up, it's like, whoa, whoa there. Where are they? No one. Where did they go? No one's here. M Miles, there were like 20 of them. According to our new good friend Ira here, uh, you're the one that wrecked this room. Well, yeah, yeah, because the TV was pissing me off, but, uh, but uh, there were 20 of them and they were screaming for blood. They were all, they, they weren't, they weren't kindred anymore. They were they were hungry and they were screaming and they said that Ravana hungers and they were trying. I, I couldn't. I couldn't. Miles, I couldn't fight them off. I'm not sure what it was. It seems very similar to the things that Kabir used to do, as far as I can tell. But you're the one who did all the wrecking here. It seems like it was some sort of mental attack, as far as I can tell. She realizes her chest is tight. And she kind of like takes a minute and whatever calm wind can ever find, she takes a minute and looks for. She kind of reaches over and pulls the curtains shut just because she needs to. So I'm not, I'm not, how do I know this is real? I have zero answers to that. Other than the fact that I'm still here and um, I feel like I would be hard to replicate. Yeah, but solipsism is a thing. I don't know what that is. The, the idea that I'm the only real thing in the world and okay. everything else is an illusion. Well, that's not going to help anyone. Ira looks at Wynn and then looks back down at the copy of The Golden Ass and has like <laughs> just sighs to himself and oh, probably still audibly just goes, Humanities majors. Psychology, actually. Soft science. Sorry, how many degrees do you have? A couple. That's Wynn, a big number. This is Mr. Ambergino's <laughs> friend. What's up? Nice to meet you. He helped me diagnose your general problem. Well, I don't know how much help I was, but I was glad to be here. Then I'm grateful for you helping my coterie mate. I'm Wynn, and apparently I'm the sheriff. Oh, shit. Well, it's a pleasure to make your acquaintance then, sheriff. Is it? I don't get well, that reply a lot. You are Mr. Ambergino's contact, right? You work with Mr. Giovanni? What? Yes, Mr. Giovanni. I believe you refer to you as your protege, actually. Mm. I... In court. In front of everyone. Oh, boy. No pressure <laughs> there, I guess. Well, um, and that means you and I, Sheriff, probably going to be spending some time together. I'm not sure what capacity either. I'm willing to hear... He pulls another morally out of the pack in his... Uh, more details. In his coat. Pops it open so one slides out, offers it to win, like he did with Miles. She kind of looks at it like, is this some sort of magic bullshit blood bond trick? <laughs> but ultimately, she still feels tight where she shouldn't feel tight, so she takes the cigarette. He turns it around, pulls one for himself, looks around. Ah, shit, I don't carry a lighter. Here. I do. Oh, you do? Well, yeah. That's handy. And he, <laughs> he she, holds his out, too. 
she pats her butt a couple times to see if it's in there and she'll find it somewhere. It's either in her pocket or in her bag. The room probably smells like cigarettes or weed. Probably more weed than cigarettes, but both. And she That was even before you and Kabir got here. <laughs> I mean <laughs> when when pre-gamed the room, she just she knows what a guy likes. Um <laughs> So Wynn will light his cigarette because she's a goddamn lady, and then she'll light her own. So you're working with Mr. Giovanni, then? Yes, and he's working with Clan Tremere. I think he mentioned a couple of things to you. We should probably go back and talk to him. He, we should go back and talk to him. Probably a great idea. Do you, do you have a ride? I don't. I. We could probably call a cab. I flew here last time. Yeah, there's only there's only room for two in that car. It's a nice car. I'll just get in the trunk, whatever. There's no trunk space in the. It, it's, oh, is it the is it the Lambo? Yes, okay. it's fine. The two of you probably have some catching up to do. I'll take a cab. I also don't mind walking. Might be good to clear my head. He can take a cab. You're coming with me. Let's go. Yes, sir, boss man. And I will call a cab and have it follow the Lambo. The cab arrives, as expected, and the group of you head off. Down the hall and headed to the foyer, you see a group of individuals that stand out like a sore thumb. But oddly, no one seems to pay attention to them. The first, of course, is Romeo. And Canary lets that click into her mind as the word, the name, and you yourself start to meld into a single person beside him and watching you with a slight grin and razor sharp teeth is the nagaraja that you recognize as codenamed phantom but there are more with jet black skin you recognize the man that taught you how to fire a gun your instructor and at times protector codenamed eagle you recognize your sire shrike who is watching you with an easy confidence seeming comfortable with how things have proceeded thus far and then there are two others that you don't recognize right away but you know all of them are Talmahera and with the invocation of the name Canary you are collected and returned into the fold hustling the group of you make your way out you notice a few things about them even Romeo the wraithly figure dark skin very charming smile that he's had in the past that smile is gone, and he is dressed in subtle body armor that includes the presence of the strange dark steel that exists in the underworld, but not in the skin lands. You recognize Phantom, adorned in a black cloak and robes of around his chest and arms, his armor, kind of tightening those spaces where elsewhere it's all flowing fabric. One of the figures has a very, very pronounced widow's peak, no facial hair, haunting gray eyes. His ears come to very subtle points, and he is this tall, thin, noble-looking man. Eastern European features are very much so pronounced on him, and he is wearing a long coat with what is visible underneath it more of that body armor that the team seems to be wearing. Whatever they're doing or wherever they're going, it is already clear that danger is expected. Another that you don't quite recognize is a woman, very small, with tan skin, chestnut-colored eyes, and she is wearing what is a rather simple modern hoodie. Again, more of that body armor, boots, simple pants, even though she is not dressed in any of the more f gaudy fashions common for a kumut, there is an aura of power that radiates from her. Eagle is dressed as he's always dressed, choosing function over panache, form-fitting clothes, a bit of a streetwear sensibility to them. He, perhaps more than the rest, carries a vast assortment of weapons on his person. Shrike, in this instance, is actually dressed rather similarly to Eagle. His boots come up to his knees. Black boot covers, all of them are wearing so much, so much black. They stick out like a sore thumb. 
One of them, the one with the widow's peak, looks to you. Canary, you are activated for a desperate mission. The time is now. The final nights are here. Prepare. All of these words are spoken in a language long forgotten by the world, but recognized by you. Gamalish, you understand every word he says, and know that you can speak it yourself. The group turns, moving in unison, yourself included, and heads outside to one of those kind of big, heavy, reinforced money trucks, and you start loading in. Shrike heads around front, your sire, and gets in position to drive. The others, you along with them, load into the back, and there you find weapons on racks, armor that is prepared for you. As the doors close to the back of the truck and it takes off, you find yourself quickly disrobing and putting on the gear that has been prepared for you. Tight leggings, long boots, that armored style of corset that you'd once seen an assassin wear, a long coat, fingerless gloves. You're dressed with a certain amount of appeal, but it is definitely meant to be useful in a firefight. How much am I myself? The canary seems to be the overlayer. Is There's no pushing back, I assume. There is. There is. That's Britta's first sense The longer canary goes through the motions, the more you find yourself aware of this automaton that exists in the back of your mind. Why don't you give me a willpower roll? Like little flickers, the motion of putting on the guns and it feeling so natural, maybe seeming to feel like sitting in Miles's car discovering that. Yeah. Okay. I would like to spend a willpower. By all means. Difficulty? Seven. Three successes. <laughs> Okay. For the time being, you are in control. What is the positions of everyone in this truck? Some are sitting, some are leaning against the wall. It looks like, for the most part, they're headed to do something really, really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And they are more or less making peace with whatever it is that they're about to do. So as Britta comes into herself and struggles to surface above this canary persona for a second. What she's going to attempt to do is appear to be continuing adjustment. In this case, this seems like an occasion where one might prefer to have a knife inside a boot rather than in a holster. So if she tries to mimic the natural way of someone giving themselves space to uh, adjust themselves and to put the knife into her boot, and instead is closing the distance for that door to just try and tuck and roll. You rush for the back door. You put your hand on it, and it starts to open. And then you rush for the back door, and you put your hand on it, and it starts to open. And then you rush for the back door, and you put your hand on it, and it starts to open. And you find yourself in a loop mentally in time. Britta definitely tries a few more times before... It goes and goes and goes, whether you want it to or not. It's just in desperation, like even maybe one or two times after she understands, she's still just uselessly praying that something she didn't try the previous time. But after those last stitch attempts, she tries to stop herself and look for the cause of whatever the heck that was. While you're studying the cause, you realize that the truck has stopped and they've arrived to where they were going. Do I appear to have set up at all? Where am I then? You are sitting right where you were before, and the door opens. The man with the widow's peak turns to you. I am Perun, of the old clan. You are about to embark on a journey. Save your strength, and know, know that this is who you are meant to be, what you are meant to do. Prita looks up at this man, and casts a glance sideways towards his unfavorable company. As you do, you recognize the front door of your cafe. And you've been in a loop so long that the group has already arrived to New Haven. And they are getting out of the truck and heading into your haven. Britta loses her words for a moment as that catches up with her. And a sinking sense of dread. Everything feels useless right now. She doesn't feel like there's a single right decision she can make, but she tries with Perrin to say, I, I don't 
Please, I don't want to be here. I will say this to you. Hear what we are to do. Allow me to remind you of your mission. And then you may decide if you are ready to be canary again. Shall we? Britta does not look willing in the slightest, but her eyes scan his and that feels like maybe the best that she can get in desperation. So she does, dragging her feet, follow him in. You are a warrior, Canary. A woman of purpose. Long ago, experimentation brought about horrors. These horrors came in the form of vicissitude. A force that mutilates the mind, body, and soul. The Sabbat see it as a tool. My wayward clanmates see it as a symbol of their power. But we know the truth. We are the Shadow Crusade. And they start, like, setting up in your haven as though they've been there before. Britta's stomach is sinking. She knows more of these words than maybe she's supposed to. She's trying to cover that. She's just trying to hear if there's something that gives her any form of hope. But the way that everyone looks so comfortable in here feels gross. She... The computers in here, they're usually off. While you're scanning around, you Mm. do notice that Romeo stays by you. And though he doesn't try to, like, smother you with his presence, is clearly making an effort to be protective of you. As if there might be some people among this group that he doesn't personally like. Britta tries to swallow down a sense of hurt. She can recognize that Romeo is trying to help, but... um. This doesn't feel good at all, (laughs) especially since uh, he seems ready to protect her, but not ready to, I mean, do my attempts to leave seem at all externally perceivable? Or have I essentially come to in exactly how I was? I think you are wrestling with yourself on this. Uh The, The truth is you don't know. Okay. You don't know if you're just going to automatically come back Mm -hmm. or if they're going to supernaturally compel you Mm -hmm. or what have you. You don't know. I I guess what I'm trying to ask is, do I have any reason to believe that Romeo has made any attempts? You do not get the impression Romeo has attempted to flee them. But that could just be because he's being smarter. So it's not uh, much of a signal in Britta's brain trying to swallow down that hurt. Britta will repeat the gesture in turn, trying to stick closer to Romeo. What can you tell us about your interactions with Zantosa and the house? Why? Because we intend to kill him. A flicker of... That doesn't feel like the answer that Britta expected. You had to fight him alone the last time. That is our fault. And you have been gone for some time. And for that, you have my apology. But he cannot be allowed to continue on. The Tremere cannot accomplish what they intend to do with him. And what is it that they intend to do? They believe him to be a sympathetic link to what lies beneath New York. Britta attempts to pass back some information in the hopes that this sort of stalemate will continue. And she says, It seemed like the house was getting worse. Vito was caretaking it, or the thing in the house. Has it reached a point where it can communicate? Did the house speak to you? I don't know if the things in that house could talk, other than Vito. Perhaps there is time. Something has happened. I must warn you. There has been a conflict. A dire one. And the Talmahera has suffered great casualties. Enoch, our city in the underworld, our place of power has been destroyed, and with it, a great deal of knowledge needed to carry us through the final nights. With what little we have remaining, we must take action against Zimitsi, for it stirs, and when it wakes, it will be Gehenna, but not the event laden with justice that we imagined it. It'll be the consumption of all life. Britta 
isn't really trying to hide exactly how cagey she is at this. I mean, obviously she would be. She's listening raptly, trying to make sense of it. Shrike heads over to you. He's right, you know. We have to put the jihad down, set it aside, and take this fucker out. Out of all of us here, you're the only one that's ever actually fought the guy. And you're the guy that, you're the one that knows Reese, right? You know where the Chantry is? Britta's posture had gone more tight as Shrike approached. She knows only vaguely more about him, but it's still reason enough to be even more cautious. And these things that he's saying don't really help her in that. Reese isn't exactly the kind of person inclined to be helpful. We are not coming to negotiate. A woman that you don't recognize speaks up. I am codenamed Tanakh. I am one of the true Bruja. I'm on the last of our kind. Our mission is a direct one. We are to infiltrate the Shantri, bypass its magical defenses, eliminate any who get in our way. And upon isolating the Xantosa, we are to kill him and atomize their remains. Nothing of him can survive, not a single cell. It is not out of hatred for you that I disagree with Perun's approach. I do not hate you at all, but I do not believe that we have the time to waste on your ability to navigate your past traumas. I haven't been a part of this, so why bring me back in? You are always a part of it. The only difference is that there was a time when you believed yourself someone else, and the time when you knew who you were. Britta doesn't look like she's sure which one this woman thinks is which. She does not specify. <laughs> and Britta does not ask, but... Baron interjects. We need you. And I promise, the life that you have, the one that you want, it is yours to keep when we are finished here. And I suspect that preventing Zantosa from being used in the way that they intend to use him will preserve that life. This mission is to your benefit. Britta grits her teeth, and she tries to sneak a peek to Romeo to see if she can spot what's on his mind. She can't fully disagree with the idea that Vito Santosa needs to die. That's That feels perfectly natural, but the idea that what they're saying makes sense just shakes her more. And so she's trying to find traction with her friend. Romeo is watching you with an uncertain expression. It's clear to you that you can see that this mission is important to him, but so are you. And it seems like he's he's hoping for some sort of reconciliation between the two, but certainly is not interested in pushing you towards some outcome. Shrike does not seem... Uh, Shrike is a little too casual about this entire situation and uh, is devoid of empathy for your situation. Tanakh, she seems aware of your emotional situation but has decided that there it is not a worthy concern at a time like this. Perun seems actually rather more empathetic to your situation and seems to have been the one that has decided for the group that they would have more of a candid conversation with you about it rather than simply using you as like a puppet. Eagle is simply making preparations. Where's Phantom in all this? Nowhere to be seen. Oh, that's disconcerting. What? When did that start? You're not sure. <laughs> I actually had been intending on saying that Britta's subconsciously about to look towards his many teeth. When you look around, he's gone. Great. <laughs> that thought occurs of trying to look towards those teeth and those being some of the first memories that she uncovered. But the next first memory, or rather the first memory, is eagle teaching her to shoot and as she finds her eyes instead landing on his preparations she looks back to her own and she says 
It doesn't sound like you're giving me a choice as to whether I'm doing this, though. Respectfully. There is no choice for any of us in this. What must be done must be done. If there was word from the Dalro, we could wait. We could see what Divination had to say about the matter. But we do not have those options. All we can do is take action now and hope. Hope that we have averted what is to come. But it looks to Shrike at that. And she asks, Is my amnesia a factor of my embrace, or was it caused by this? If I do this, would I get my memory back, or is it just me being left out of this? At the mention of your amnesia, they kind of look between each other. Not quite having expected you to say something like that. Britta is confused at their confusion. Uh, yeah, sure. We'll figure it out. That is not convincing to Britta. <laughs> that is a Miles plan if I've ever mm-hmm. heard one. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure that out yep. later. <laughs> that sounds like a tomorrow night problem. <laughs> Having a little too much experience with that kind of answer at this point. <laughs> Britta does not find that to be a part of her calculations. <laughs> What about the thing in the house? It is a shard, piece of a greater whole. Of course, it must be eliminated, but we do not yet know how. Something is happening in the east, and many of what remains of our resources has been directed there, and they are hoping to communicate with it, reminded of our place at its side. But while that happens, there is work to be done here. And you, Canary, you are skilled, dangerous, a worthy asset of the Dalmahera. Britta connects eyes. Being called skilled and dangerous feels just untrue at this point. The way that this short beginning to the night has gone, it feels... Flattery is not uh, very convincing, but she knows she's... <laughs> that She knows that they don't need to convince her. She has enough at the back of her mind to keep in constant question when her sense of independence might shut off. But being told she's an asset of of the Tamahira, that feels true enough. There's one more glance to the door. Again, that like instinct to try and just leave the memory of the repeating attempt coming back. She doesn't seem to know how to follow through on that and swallows how can i believe you that you would leave me alone after this in the lands of the dead there is a mark upon your palm and makes you my sister and makes you our sister and if this is meant to be our doom the end of the Dalmahera, then i am pleased to know that you have an unlife worth pursuing i will leave you to your peace But, until the Zantosa is killed, until there has been vengeance for what the Soul Eaters have done to my clan, to my blood, we cannot rest. We cannot yield. Sister, I need you. The first time he calls her his sister, empathy comes back into Britta, and there's a lack of... She's not sure in that moment she's not sure he says it with so much conviction that she's wondering if she's missing something missing something in her previous self that maybe this is a family for her or would she want to leave what can't she remember those are the sort of thoughts that are going through her and that empathy grows as he describes his feelings about it she's looking like she wants to ask more questions about what it is his part of his clan has gone through, but they've mentioned time and the rest of the group has shown their lack of patience. There's a slow and then a quick two stiff nods, not quite agreeing to do it, but understanding that she has no choice. Do you need sustenance? Very much. Very well. Let us prepare. You will need your strength. I'll... 
I'll go hunt. That won't be necessary. She looks up, trying to figure out what that could even mean. Come upstairs. He starts moving upstairs, and the group seems to leave Eagle downstairs to watch over the area. She goes with them. Upstairs, you find what looks to be like, you know, 14, 15 ammo cases. And some of them are opened up, revealing gear that's been transported from who knows where. Uh, In other cases, there are like softball-sized canopic jars. And they're all laid out. And Shrike picks one up, cracks the wax seal over the top. And you are stricken with the aroma of Vitae. And they look like the ones that the Setites had? It does look similar to how the Setites had arranged theirs. Kind of keeping an eye on Shrike. Watching him out of the corner of her eye in the same way that one would when they're trying to learn anything about someone. Just every detail uh, she's trying to take in. But she does go over to feed, effectively. As you're feeding, uh, you're actually offered what looks like um, this hunk of amethyst. Take time. Attune yourself to it. It will restore your resolve. You will be at your very best. Britta hesitantly takes the amethyst, a small dip of the head, very unsure, and looking over the rest of the group, tries to follow the instruction. As you follow the instruction, a lot of the tension starts to wear away for you as working in this fashion and kind of giving in to the almost automatic behavior that is um, caused by being in their presence seems to be a bit of a comfort in this time. And before you know it, you're making preparations just like everyone else, an agent of the Talmahira. Johnny, you and Crystal, the two of you rush towards the sounds of whatever carnage just happened around the corner. As you make your way there, you can smell smoke and see bits of debris, like little chunks of plastic that were clearly once parts of a car. By the time you get there, you can smell the blood. A certain detective you recognize lies pressed to a stone and mortar wall. Portions of a little sedan, or was once a sedan, crush his left leg, leaving him pinned underneath it. Jesus. Johnny goes rushing over. There's blood spurting from his mouth, and you see he's holding up this badge. A badge that holds no meaning for him anymore, at least shouldn't because he's not a police officer. But he holds it up in the same way that a priest holds up a cross. And while he holds it there, his eyes dare not shift towards you. And he instead stares out past the smoke, seeing something in the darkness. Uh, Of course you're here now. I'm holding it still. But I don't know how much longer I can. Crystal, support him. Crystal dutifully heads over to her friend. Suarez, you fucked up. I know. Once she has a hold on him, Johnny's going to just casually push away the remains of the sedan to unpin him. What seems to be like a bumper engine block and some of the axle are just tossed aside all too casually by the Bruja. What you see underneath it is mostly just blood-dimmed denim, crushed pieces of meat and bone. His leg, whatever was pinned, is completely pulverized. He should be in shock, but there's something about the man's sense of grit that has him held together well beyond what a normal man would be able to endure in these circumstances. And he stares at the monster that would normally send the human mind running in terror while he sits there paralyzed and bleeding out. Johnny follows his uh, gaze and uh, looks down through the smoke to try and catch glimpse of the creature. As you peer into the smoke, roll me perception plus investigation. One success. You keep low and you peer through the smoke and there you find a beast bipedal but down on all fours in the moment. It's covered in like a deep storm, almost bluish gray fur that is matted, bloodied, covered in scars. It's missing some of its teeth. Its lip seems to have been split in the past, 
an eye is milky white and its mane of fur. You can see braids and bits of bone and metal and little trophies that this much, much more experienced werewolf collected during the course of its life of war. Unlike the lupine you had seen before, this one has strange effigies and fetishes that dangle from knots of fur and what bits of clothes that seem to have been able to transform with it. Its claws glint with silver light in the dark. It bears the visage of the mythological destroyer wolf, and you can see it just looking at it. You can feel centuries upon centuries of warfare, of bloodshed, of primal rage manifest in its uh, visage. I need a courage check. Yeah. I'll spend a willpower. Yes, sir. And that will counteract the uh, the one that I rolled, so it's a wash. Okay. You find yourself unable to approach it in the moment. Even as a creature who is cursed and damned, there is just enough will to live inside of you that keeps you from getting any closer. Suarez, whatever you're doing with that badge is holding it at bay. Yeah. He answers, and you can see he's starting to get a little pale. Can you keep that up if we move you? Uh... I'll try. Uh, Johnny, his eyes dart around for a, a, a safe way to get the hell out of here. Not seeing a, a, a particularly safe route. <sighs> he is going to... I want to jump out of here with leaps and bounds, but I don't think it's a good idea to be doing that with a mortal, especially in his condition. You definitely get the feeling that that kind of jostling can really put him over the edge. But if he stays there, he's no better for it. Hmm. As you consider, the hand holding up the badge falters just an inch or two. To hell with this, Sor Suarez. I'm so sorry. He uh, scoops him up into his arms. Crystal, grab onto my back. She looks at you like she is about to ask what, why, and reconsiders the choice before the words quite start to come out of her mouth and she just bunching her hand into fists grips your jacket as she clings on to you holding suarez you can feel and you're like those like meaty hands of yours that this man is like he's like holding glass Compared to you, he is impossibly frail. Johnny is going to channel his blood through his limbs and leap up towards the roof of the building in front of him. Now that you're holding Suarez, I need you to roll a d10. And if you roll anything less than an 8, Suarez falls unconscious. He falls unconscious. <sighs> As you're looking up to the roof and you brace your heels, bend your knees, and get ready to jump, you hear the monster go loose behind you. And I need you to roll initiative. Oh, I don't like that noise. 14. 27. <laughs> the very spirit of the fray drives it forward. Hey, man, you want to use that weak nightmares to go first? Uh I need Suarez to hold it off just a little bit longer. I need him to remain to, to, to cling to consciousness just a few moments more so that we can break line of sight of this thing. For every time you burn successes on that willpower roll, I'm going to let you re-roll that d10. Here's your first one. Go ahead. <sighs> nope. Okay. Ugh. Something about the hunter's nature keeps its destiny from being manipulated, and it lets out a booming howl. And you can feel its breath against your back in the course of an instant. And it swings its meaty claws. And as it's, it's sorry, it's, it's massive silver, almost hooked claws. And as it does, there is a shout that comes from a voice you recognize from your haven. And she wails, no, 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 no. And something about that manipulates the inertia of the monster's swing, as if even in a frenzy, it finds itself second-guessing whether or not it's doing the right thing. So, first, 
You may sacrifice an action to dodge if you would like. Yeah, that seems reasonable to me. Secondly, Sheila, as you can see her, enacts an edge. Her almost divine sense of compassion breaks through the primal urge of this raging werewolf just enough that it hesitates and suffers a penalty. It's going to roll its attack. She is going to roll her edge. Every success she gets on her edge is going to take away a success from the werewolf. The remaining successes from the werewolf, however, will be counted against your dodge roll. So let's get a dodge roll from you. You ready? I'll spend a point of willpower. Uh, She will risk four points of conviction. So the lupine has eight successes on the attack roll. With the willpower spent and the fact that Johnny is swift, he has seven successes to dodge. With the slight nudge that comes from the bartender you helped all that time ago, the expert killer... The apex predator, its claws rake your leather jacket, splitting the leather as if it were made of nothing. But you remain unharmed. Crystal lets go of you. Okay. And jumps onto the werewolf. She successfully initiates a grapple (laughs) with... They get a Fenris. Uh, she does not possess sufficient strength to actually hold it because its strength rating is more than double her. It is just going to go through her attempt to hold him soon enough. You make it to the roof. Well, I don't know that I do. I spent my action to dodge. That is true, and you don't have any celerity actions. I did not burn yep. for any celerity. Looks like you stay down here. Okay. With everyone having burned their actions on that, we go to round two. I don't have the blood to be spending on celerity while I'm holding a guy bleeding out. I'm spending three blood for celerity actions. Okay. Puts my initiative down to 11. Understood. Johnny's eyes go to pinpricks as he feels the tank drop out from under him. And he probably takes on a very, even without the hunter's sight, bestial appearance. His fangs drop, and his mouth starts to gape with hunger. But he is running hot like an engine. The lupine growls, and it's it's such a massive presence that you can feel your still heart kind of tremble in the presence of just that kind of, like, level of bass. And the last thing you see before giving in to your own beast and contending with this monster is... Do I immediately go to Hunger Frenzy by being to zero? Well, you do get a self-control check, but you have zero dice. Oh. Oh. You could spend a point of willpower to have one success and no dice. Yeah, I'll do that. That's that. that's, then that, all right, then that's yeah, what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not intending to lose control myself. Okay. I, I, I just need all those actions. Mm-hmm. Man. All right, so here we are at the bottom of the barrel. You dig deep. It reflexively activates a gift and will attack its grappler at difficulty three. With seven successes, it bites into the Avenger who stepped forward to fight it. The Lupine currently has a strength rating of 14. Plus one bite. (laughs) Joey's mom will suffer 13 levels of aggravated damage and is torn asunder. There is a spray of blood in all directions, and in an instant, she is rendered into an unrecognizable pile of meat. Its head shakes and shakes and shakes, waving the chunks of flesh until it all comes loose and falls apart on the ground, against the wall, on your clothes, all over Suarez, the area is covered in the mother's flesh. Johnny, here we go. I'll spend a willpower to maintain control of myself. Understood. With the shower of blood from Crystal being torn apart as coolly as he can, Johnny turns, levels the heavy revolver at the kneecap of the werewolf, and fires point blank. I'll spend a willpower... And we'll have three successes. Two successes will carry over into damage. So eight dice altogether? Yes, sir. Two damage. And it has been hamstringed, correct? Correct. You have performed uh, a hamstring maneuver. 
Your aim is true, and the silver round punctures through the iron solid flesh. And while it doesn't seem to experience pain, its ability to hold its weight up falters, and it drops down to the three limbs that are still functional. What this will mean for you is that its ha- its movement rating is halved because of how long this beast has been in the throes of frenzy. It's gassed in terms of its ability to take multiple actions. So while extremely dangerous, there is now a limit to how much harm it can cause around itself. Johnny, who is expecting to have to dodge another claw before he would be able to jump away, sees this thing with its head now level with his, and his brow kind of knots up, his beast wanting to break free and go to frenzy, and he holds it in check for just a few moments longer as he uses his celerity to fire another round directly into its head. It's as you stare down at it and it looks back at you, you see it. You see how much his daughter looked like him. Difficulty seven, point blank? Yes. I will spend another point of willpower. Seven successes. Six successes will carry over into damage. <sighs> Come on. Uh, being that I'm shooting at the head, are there any increased difficulty for uh, playing, or doing damage? or? Uh, you do get an extra three dice of damage. Five damage altogether. You strike it for another five health levels of unsoakable aggravated damage, and it shakes its head in the way that an animal does when a fly gets too close to its eye. Johnny fires again. <sighs> My second action. Another point of willpower. Six successes. That's five that will carry over to damage dice. Another six levels of damage. You hit it. And for a moment, you swear its heart stops. But you seem to have pushed it to a new height of rage. And the silver wounds close. And its regeneration gets pumped into overdrive as the monster refuses to die. For a moment, you swear it recognizes your scent. This is such a bad situation. Mm-hmm. How many actions do you have left this round? I have one action left. I have two points of willpower. Ugh. I have zero blood. There's this uh, moment in a fight where you have this choice of, all right, do we retreat while I've got it on the ropes, or do I go for the knockout and mm-hmm. end this straight out? Yeah. And the question is, like, if you don't knock them out... <laughs> You die. The other problem is, is that I will not be able to take multiple actions after this. This is it. No, Hopefully fuck it. I'm putting another bullet in this werewolf. Let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. Eat silver. Spending another point of willpower. Five successes with the willpower. Four carry over, and remember, plus three damage for shooting in the face. Four successes. Okay. With four successes, you fire right into its open maw as it moves to snap its jaws shut over your head. And before it can quite make it to your face as it does that, like, lunge, the round enters its mouth. You see it hit the back of its throat. You hear it ricochet off of some metal somewhere behind it as there's an exit wound and the monster collides against you slumping and breathing shallowly as it begins to revert back into the shape of a man Johnny drops the pistol and kind of catches this form and tries to push it back aloft with with that free arm while Letting Suarez drop to the ground. Sheila rushes over. Johnny will spend another point of willpower. Get Suarez out of here. She nods fast. What about the man? She says, looking at the clear, blood-covered monster. We have to help him. Johnny sinks his teeth into the man. Johnny, no. You have to help him. 
You have to help him. Whatever's happening, he is a victim. He is a victim of this. Please. Johnny does not drink. I need blood. Pick me. Please. I'll help you. He you help get them down. He does not help. argue anymore. He grabs, he grabs her <laughs> and starts to drink. She holds Johnny very, very tightly as he feeds from her. Path of Night is a Vampire the Masquerade podcast set in the world of darkness. Britta Ashcroft, the Toreador, was played by Rebecca Segelfess. Johnny Saxon, the Bruja, was played by Garrett Gabby. Miles Savinport, the Venture, was played by Tim Davis. Neil Foster, the Malkavian, was played by Rob Muirhead. Wynn Cabot, the Gangrel, was played by Erica Webb. Your storyteller was Lex Lopez. Recording by Rebecca Segelfess. This episode edited by Rob Muirhead. The music used in this episode was composed for Path of Night by Brian Metolius. Find him online at brianmetolius.com. Path of Night uses the 20th anniversary edition of Vampire the Masquerade with a few limited house rules. Vampire the Masquerade and the World of Darkness are owned by Paradox Interactive. Make sure to subscribe to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. We can be found on YouTube at youtube.com slash at Path of Night. You can help support the show on coffee.com slash Path of Night. Find us on twitter.com slash Path of Night Pod, on facebook.com slash Path of Night Podcasts, or email us at Path of Night Podcasts at gmail.com. See you next time, Kindred. <laughs> Look, I just know anger is your strongest virtue. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Miles. Anger's a virtue, right? <laughs> <laughs>